Amen. In the studies that we've been doing over this week, I've tried to focus on certain aspects of methodology that we should be using. So if I were just to say parables, I hope you can see now that's an oversimplification of the subject. So, yes, we need to focus on parables, but often we don't use parables in the correct way. So we spoke about parables, and we also spoke about trying to create a story that would help ensure that what we're teaching has some consistency. It's too easy to create um, random waymarks and still make something look accurate when indeed it may be wrong. So we did all of that through the book of Joel. And then we looked at why we even discussed the subject of prophecy. Because it's all focused or centered around the subject of God's people being captivity. We discussed how the natural stories of captivity were prefiguring or were types of a spiritual captivity. And spiritual captivity is basically being in the bondage of Satan. <coughs> and the problem is God's people recognize and realize that the world is in spiritual bondage. But what we're not willing to see is that we are no better than the world. In fact, when you consider the advantages that we have, we're in a worse condition than the world. And I don't think we could encapsulate that thought in a better way than Paul does. In the following verse, the book of Romans, We'll go to Romans chapter 3. While you're turning there, just some trivia information. Paul writes the book of Romans while he's in Corinth. He's never actually visited the Roman church. He's never visited them. He's ne he doesn't know who they are. So he's essentially writing to strangers. And in chapter 3 he comes to this remarkable conclusion. In verse 9, he summarizes or comes to a conclusion of everything that he said in the first two chapters and the first part of chapter 3. To try to understand the context, in verse 1, 
He asks a question, it's a rhetorical question. Is there any advantage in being a Jew compared to being a Gentile? And his answer in verse 2 is yes. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So he says the advantage of being a Jew is that you've got this great responsibility and you have this great light. But then if you jump over to verse 9, he asks another rhetorical question. Is there any advantage in being a Jew? But he expresses it this way. Are we better than the Gentiles? And he says no, because we've already proved that everyone is under sin. So verse 9 says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jew and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. But when he says he's proved it, he just says, I stated this as a fact. Now, this truth, that I guess many people would agree with, because they tend to want to spiritualize or moralize this, is one of the cornerstones of Paul's logic or his um, message. And his message is this, that in his history, there are two churches, there are two groups, if you like. And let, let's try and explain that in his own language using a different model. So let's go to the book of Galatians. As you're turning there, we'll review what we said about Romans 3. He says, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, it makes no difference. Because you're in the same condition. You're in sin. And what we tend to do today when we read Romans, we tend to bring it down to the individual level. And what we don't want to recognize is that Paul is dealing with this, is dealing with this at a corporate level. He's saying the whole nation is in the same condition as the Gentiles. And this, there's this tension that's created because of this message. Now we spoke about this yesterday when we spoke about the work of John. When we saw those two parallel kingdoms or movements. But I used it in the framework of a house. Hopefully you'll remember. We spoke about the house of David and the house of Saul. So if we come to the book of Galatians, 
in chapter 4, Paul is going to develop this argument further about the condition of the church. We'll pick up from verse 21. Don't read yet. What we're about to do is we're going to see Paul develop a number of parallel thoughts or ideas. He's going to compare two groups of people through this concept of an allegory or a parable. And he'll develop them point by point until he gets to his climax. So it's going to begin with Abraham and end with Jerusalem. So in verse 21, he speaks about those people who desire to be under the law or under its control. What we want to be clear about that he's speaking to the people that are in the movement. He's not speaking to the Jewish church or the Sanhedrin. He's speaking about those disciples who have followed after Christ. But you'll see there's a problem in their thinking because they still have this constant desire to go back to the thoughts and ideas of the church. And that church is under sin, which is already proved in the book of Romans. So after making this statement in verse 21, this question, he asks them something. He says, do you not hear the law? Are you not familiar with Old Testament history? Verse 22 talks about Abraham having two wives and two sons. One is a slave called a bondwoman. And the other one is free. So these are the two wives of Abraham. And each one has children. So I want to suggest that when you have Abraham, and his two wives that he's using a parable as hopefully we'll all understand that this is a symbol of Christ and his church that's what that marriage is symbolizing so you see a situation where Christ has got two wives and they're there at the same time and we all know that's illegal. It's against the law to have two wives at the same time. And Paul brings this subject up in Romans chapter 7. But in Romans 7, it's the other way round. Now, 
one wife with two husbands. So we can parallel this concept of one wife having two husbands. And overlay it into this concept where you've got one husband with two wives. When we talk about children, I want to suggest that based upon the principle that you find in Exodus chapter 20, And in Psalms 78, I think it's 78, is that the word child or children is a symbol. And it's really dealing with a prophetic subject, which is the fourth generation. And we saw this in the book of Joel. So I'm making the assertion that when this um, woman has a son or a child, we can understand it to symbolize the fourth generation. We see this argument being used in a number of different places. I'll give you another place where we see this. Keep your hands in Galatians. Turn to the book of Matthew. As you're turning there, I want us to remember that we'd already developed an argument to say that the number four equaled what? A progressive destruction and also the end of destruction. Hopefully we remember that. So if we go to Matthew 23 and yesterday evening we mentioned Matthew 23. Let's go uh, first to verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So, desolate means destroyed. So Christ is telling them that their house is being destroyed. Matthew 23, verse 38. So I want to see in the history of Christ, in that dispensation, the, the house of Judah is destroyed. We might call it the house of Israel or the Jews. And if you turn back to verse 30, this is what the Jews would say. So Jesus is quoting them. If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. So, as in this case, you have just a single generation. Verse 30 talks about single generation. You could argue that the word fathers means forefathers. But 
but I'm saying that in the context it just says fathers and children and in verse 31 Jesus responds and says wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. So I'm saying, when you see father and children, you have a dynamic where the children are going to do what? What will the children do? It says they'll fill up the cup that their fathers had begun to fill. And if you filled the cup, what does that mean? It means you've come to the end. The work began with the fathers and ends with the children. But in Joel, where does it begin? Here at number one, where you get this progressive destruction that goes one, two, three, four, and it's filled. So I want us to see that in Matthew 23, he says, Father and children. The fathers begin to fill and the children complete the work. So children becomes a symbol of the fourth generation or the end. Hopefully we're okay with that concept. So coming back to Galatians. When Paul begins to introduce the subject of sons or children, what's, what is he dealing with? He's not just dealing with the two boys. What are their names, by the way? Who's this one? And this one? So Isaac and Ishmael. But I want to suggest that in the context of what Paul is trying to describe, it's a present tense experience. Because that's what an allegory or a parable is. So this is the church today and the children is also a symbol of the church today. And we're getting the concept of today from this fourth generation or the end. Coming back to Galatians 4. Verse 23. But he who was of the bondman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. So this is flesh, and this is promise. What does flesh mean? What would it mean if you're created in the flesh? Sin and promise Righteous If we're going to take this 
in a present day experience when you get to the end Paul makes an interesting point here that may not be obvious at first sight when he talks about the church today when was the church created? Was it created a long time ago or has it just been born now? So some people are saying right back in creation. But remember, he's using two different symbols for church. So you might argue that this one could take you back a long time ago when they married Abraham. But what's being introduced here? Is it not a birth? The children are born. And if, if they're children, they're a symbol of what generation? The fourth. The end. So Paul's making a specific point about the condition of the church at the end. And he's going to describe it by the birth of these two children. So I want to suggest that he's talking about a special experience that's unique in that generation or that dispensation. So I'll express it this way. That the children and their birth is dealing with the birth of a church. So how can you have a church that's been around from creation and at the same time have the idea that the church is just born? Let me try to draw that. This is creation and this is the dispensation of Jesus. So we said, someone said that the church was here. I won't say born, I'll say created. And I'm suggesting children means end or fourth or the church today and they've just been born from what? How can the church be born from the church? So I'm saying the church here is born Even if you don't understand everything about this, does this make sense, at least the logic of that? Say amen if the logic makes sense. Okay, so very few people. We're so used to the word parables. We read about them about a woman losing coins, about a shepherd losing sheep. We think they're like children's stories. Not for adults. So all I'm doing is talking about parables at an adult level And obviously some of us are not 
used to dealing with parables at this, I call it this advanced level, this mature level. So what I really want us to see is not so much, you know, the right answer, because that doesn't really matter. What I want us to discuss is the approach because I'm sure all of you have read Galatians 4 but what I want us to see is that if you approach this, these verses using this technique of parables you can glean a lot of information we don't, we're not making it up I'm not inventing it, it's not my logic. We're not going to the spirit of prophecy. I borrowed some concepts from other places, but we're not going to other Bible verses to prove this. I'm just trying to stay in the verses to show us how we can approach our reading of Scripture. Okay, so if you understand what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, let me have another go to explain what I'm trying to us. I'm trying for us to see. Paul in the book of Romans says the church and the world are in exactly the same situation. He just says that is a fact. He, the English word says, I've proved. But in the original Greek, it means I've accused. Or charged. Okay, so I came to the book of Galatians to develop that thought and he has Abraham with two wives, two sons. One was born of flesh, one of promise. And my brother told me that flesh means sin. And if this is a symbol of Christ marrying his church, we know this is, a, this is all about the church. Are you okay at that level? So say Amen. So we're okay at that level. So now we can directly connect Galatians and Romans. The Jewish church is in sin. Romans 3. Ishmael is born in sin. Galatians 4. Are we okay with that? Say amen if you're okay. So if Galatians says the Jews the Jewish nation is in sin. And in Galatians it says Ishmael is in sin. We know these are the same. Therefore what? We know that the Jews and Ishmael are the same. Are we okay with that? That's just proof texting. So hopefully that's really reasonably straightforward. 
So now I've said, coming back to Joel, you've got four generations. And four generations means a progressive destruction or the end of destruction. So one, two, three, four, this is the end. Then we went to Matthew 23. And when Jesus is speaking to the leaders of the church, what did the leaders call themselves? In verse 30. 23:30, what did they call themselves? They called themselves children. Hopefully remember that. Check for yourselves. They said, we are the children and we had fathers. And then Jesus in verse 31 says, Are you sure you admit to being children? Why would he say that? Because what image are children born into? Or born with? They're born in the image of their fathers, their parents. In verse 38, it says, your house. Who is the your? Who is that person when he says your house? That's the leaders. And the leaders are the children. So the children's house is destroyed. We agree with that. When does destruction happen? In the fourth generation, which is the children. God says, in the Ten Commandments, if you sin, how long does the punishment go on for? Till the fourth generation. I know it says the third and the fourth, but this is a preliminary study, a surface study. So I'm saying number one is the father, and number four is the what? The children. So that's why I said, children is the fourth and final generation. Are we okay with that? Say amen. Now the children must be born at some time in history, yes? These two boys were born. And they were born at some time from these parents. That's just the natural. Now, when you come to this story here, when are the children born? Are they born here? No. 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 They're born here. So, if we were going to put this in a timeline, where would they be born? Not here, not here, and not here. And certainly not here. They're born here. This is the fourth. We okay with that? Say amen. And this is the present. Or today. What can cause us difficulties is that parables, even though they're very simple like this, 
have multiple layers of thought. Who comes first? The mother church or the children church? The mother does. But he's trying to tell us that the mother church is here as well. And we know that in real life. The parent, the mothers were there at the same time. So if we take this concept, which church would this be? This would be the mother. And this one? This would be the children. Are we okay with that now? And we know that the children are born sometime after the mothers. Are we okay with that? Say amen. Because there are more people now. When I give you the answer, you will probably say that was deliberately more complicated than you needed to make it. But what I want us to do is change our minds to start thinking like God thinks. The Bible says, let this mind be in you which God gave to Jesus. Jesus thinks in a certain way. And what way is that? It's parables. It's not just being a nice man. So we tend to moralize that verse and we say think like Jesus thinks be nice to people but I've read Bible verses where Jesus swears at people I've read Bible verses where he swears at people I've read Bible verses where Jesus swears at people, calls them bad names. If I pointed to one of my sisters and called her a daughter of Satan, I'm sure some of you would say that's not Christ-like. I'd say it's not. But it's Baptist-like. And if he's the greatest prophet and he can do that, why can't I? So I want to suggest surface treasure is a moral way of approaching scripture. But our brother took us to Proverbs 25 verse 2. And it's our glory to search out those treasures and like Paul charge or accuse people Not based upon their morality, but based upon the prophecy. So when he talks about having the mind of Christ, this is the mind of parable teaching. If you're interested in this subject, I recommend you watch the series of presentations we did in Nairobi. And 
All of us are familiar that Paul says we're supposed to be in living epistles. And what is an epistle? It's a letter. I want to suggest what Paul is referring to is that we're supposed to be living parables just like Jesus was. What was Jesus on the outside? Natural or spiritual? Natural. What was he on the inside? Spiritual. If you have spiritual and natural together, what do we call that? Parable. This is humanity and divinity. So, what I want us to do is begin to approach scriptures in that way because that's how they were written. Okay, so now for the explanation. There's been one church from the very beginning of Earth's history. That's why people said, when I said, when was the church born? People said, creation. But the parable is teaching something different. For a start, how many churches do you have in this model? One. Two. Now how many do we have? Four. There are four churches. Two mothers, two children. So, when we've got this one church, all of us are familiar with Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. How many churches are there in those chapters? So it's a trick question because you could answer one and get the right answer or say seven and still get the right answer. Okay, so now can we see how we can have a church being born long after creation? Yes? Because it's dealing with one church but it's discussing the church through its different dispensations. Now, as Adventists, all of us should be sure that when we take these seven churches of Revelation, that these seven churches represent how many churches? One church. And what church is that? The Christian church. So that's standard Adventist teaching. Now we might argue about where each one begins and ends. But one thing that we all agree on is that number one Ephesus and number seven Laodicea that this is the disciples and this is the SDA church. Everybody knows that. We may argue about the churches in between. But what we may not be familiar with is that the church didn't begin in the time of Christ. The church has been around long before. 
awali and we might want to pick up the church not from creation but from the Jewish nation so I'll take this out and I'm going to say when the Jews began or ancient Israel and we could mark that from Moses and when did the Jewish church end? in the history of Christ I think we're all familiar with that now once you can see that you can make many applications to confirm that this concept is correct so I just want to make one application perhaps one of the overarching symbols of Laodicea is that they're blind and who's blind in Laodicea everyone the leadership and the laity we all agree with that it's taken straight out of Revelation chapter 3 so if we go to Matthew chapter 15 Verse 14. Go ahead and read that. So it says here that the leaders are blind. And who are they leading? They're leading other blind people. You can see the same passage in Luke 6.39. So Luke 6.39 and Matthew 15.14 are the same. So this passage teaches us that the leadership are blind in the time of Christ and so is the laity. So I want to suggest and this is just a very simple proof, it's a preliminary proof to show that the church in the time of Christ is Laodicea it has that experience so once we can see that I want to come back to this story it's going to teach us many things first of all which child is born first Ishmael so if we were to do hope you remember what I just drew there I'll redraw it up here like this the fourth generation has a singular starting point are these sons living at the same time yes the brothers Ishmael is born before Isaac and 
So here's Isaac and here's Ishmael. What we would want to do is we'd want to understand when are these boys born? In the context that Paul is trying to teach us. Where would we go? How far would we go back to understand what today means? Or present? I'm sure if you've been in this movement for any length of time and you're familiar with reform lines that you're going to go back to the beginning so we could say that this was the time of the end or the birth of someone who was born at the time of the end in the line of Christ John and Jesus and if this is correct correct application I'm suggesting that it is that you know Ishmael is before so the fourth generation begins before the time of the end and we can demonstrate that through other lines just want to show us you can get all of this the creation of a line in the present tense and the present tense would be the New Testament which begins with the birth of John and Jesus all of that from a couple of verses in the book of Galatians chapter 4 all you need to do is just spend some time thinking about what those verses are really teaching so it's showing us the church has been around for a long time the mothers they're here now and it's going to teach us different experiences for both of those churches I've got Ishmael here and who, who do we tag with Ishmael? Who's connected with Ishmael? Hagar the slave and who's connected with Isaac? Sarah What is the one singular characteristics we have about the slave? The Paul gives us bondage and the free I just will say that they're free. Ishmael does what? Persecute. So what we can do is we can show that there's this bondage and this persecution and this persecution begins before the time of the end and that Isaac is going to be persecuted but the church is also free all of that can be gleaned from these um, simple parables these people are in sin these people are righteous so can you see how Paul with subtlety but with precision and cleverness introduces a simple model 
unaweza kuona jinsi ambavyo Paulo anatumia mbinu ama anatumia mafumbo rahisi a simple family tree kupitia kwa mwili ama mfumo wa familia and he can teach us so much truth na anajaribu kutufunza kweli mwili when you realize unapotambua that they both dealing with the church kwamba wote wanazungumzia kanisa and there's one more It's already here. But you have two churches at the same time. We said four. But what we really got is two churches. That are intention of conflict from, with one another. And we know that they're born here not at the very beginning of the story and this concept of being born or coming to existence is showing us that when we take these churches and that we've just used them sequentially one after the other that that must be incorrect that by the time you come to the seventh church which is Laodicea a church that's in bondage do we know they're in bondage? we do John says they're the sons of Satan Jesus says they're the sons of murderers that there must be another church in that history and what we would have to do we'd have to work out which church is that which one do we want to pick so I want to just show this picture work in a slightly different way so we can see what that other church would be all of us are supposed to be teachers I've mentioned this before but we should never tire of hearing this it's our responsibility to take complex ideas and simplify them so what I'm teaching is standard thoughts and ideas that we're teaching our movement we could have done this using Ezekiel 37 there are various ways we could have approached this all I'm doing is showing you that you can approach this problem in a very simple and straightforward fashion that you don't have to be a mental gymnast to be to do this work you just get it straight from the verses it's not difficult to see and so if we can find it in this chapter think how many other places we could also find this concept that we haven't even begun to explore yet we should be bending our energies not to make the message complicated but to make it simple having said that if this is number seven for the Jewish dispensation and I'm going to call this ancient Israel Israel 
if this was number seven, we'd have number one. And I suggested this was Moses to Christ. And if you're interested to develop this idea, you could go to the book of Hebrews. Because in the book of Hebrews, what is Paul going to do? He's going to show you the relationship of two men. Of Moses and Christ. And at one level, he says they're the same person. But at another level, this person is far superior. What does Christ initiate in his, in his lifetime? In his, in his dispensation? He initiates a change in the priesthood. And what does Moses do? Exactly the same thing. The more you look, the more parallels you'll see between these two experiences. The reason why I mention that is because it's this concept of a change in priesthood or a change in dispensation that's going to be identifying why we get two churches here. Who are supposed to be the shepherds of the flock? The leaders. If I ask it a different way, who is the shepherd of the flock? Jesus. But he doesn't do the work himself. He hires people. And often they let him down. If you want to see where people let him down, you go to Matthew 13. And it's brought to view in verse 25. It says, Men slept. Matthew 13, 25. And those men were supposed to be awake. The Son of Man, Jesus, has left these people in charge. So when we talk about the shepherds and the leaders, we could say they're the under-shepherds. The hired shepherds. Jeremiah speaks about these people in chapter 23, which we're not going to read. But if we're okay with the concept that the leadership of the church are the shepherds, let's go to Matthew 10. If you go from verse 1, it says there are 12 shepherds, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. It says 12 disciples. Verses 2 and 3 and 4 list the names. And then verse 5, Jesus takes these 12 and says, Don't go to this group. But in verse 6, it says, go to the sheep. So if you're going to go to the sheep that are lost, we're familiar with that parable. 
where the shepherd goes and finds out that lost sheep the 12 disciples are the shepherds and the shepherds therefore what? they're now leaders we already affirm that this is Matthew 10 that's in this history here in the final week of Daniel 9 so we can see in this history there's a change of leadership from the Sanhedrin to the disciples we already identified Hebrews 7 there's a change of priesthood in the history of Moses there's a change of priesthood and the priests primary role their most important role were to be the leaders of the flock so what we're identifying is in the seventh there's to be a change in the first is be, there's to be a change so when we see in this history there's to be a change and who are the new shepherds it's the disciples so this new church here that's been born here at the time of the end is the beginning of the Christian church which is number one leading all the way to number seven and you can see in the first church there's a change identifying a change at number one and also that there's a change at number seven so we saw very simply from Galatians 4 you've got two mothers and two children the children mark a birth of church and I'm saying this is the time of the end it's the final generation the final generation of the Jewish nation and the beginning of a generation of free children so we can show that this concept from Revelation 2 and 3 occurs in two dispensations ancient Israel and spiritual Israel and that these two churches overlap here and this concept is one of the most important keys that explains what's happening today in the world and in our church let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you we thank you Lord that hid underneath the surface of your word are truths waiting to be dug up and rescued and to be placed in their proper setting for all to admire Lord may it be our will to have the mind of Christ so that we might understand in a way that perhaps we haven't before how to approach your word in a way that will bring us joy and pleasure as it did William Miller and also bring hope and salvation to our fellow brethren. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.